Hello, it's Scott Manley here in Seattle, Washington. I'm here for a few days because we have Penny Arcade Expo. I'm going to be there on the Saturday. I'm going to be meeting some game developers. I'm also spending time at the Museum of Flight, seeing cool planes. They have the shuttle trainer and other stuff there. But today, everyone's been talking about the Starship Hopper because it flew. Many people were impressed by it. Some people wondered what the big deal was, and there were lots of questions. So. Let's just recap. Monday they were going to fly, the uh, road closures happened, no TAMs happened, residents got their warning, counter ticked down, and at T0 the engine started firing, and instead of exhausting, you know, huge amounts of powerful heat, we got cryogenic methane and liquid oxygen just expelled out of the combustion chamber because their ignition system failed. They have two independent torch igniter system so they use like a small amount of fuel and oxidizer mixed together and an electric spark to generate like a little flamethrower and then they you know inject that into the chamber it's the same system the space shuttle used and of course this is what you want on a rocket engine that has to be able to fire and then stop and then relight again you want a repeatable ignition system so this wasn't a great ad for it, but yeah, they went and they worked to fix it. There was actually some great photos. I think it was Trevor Melman, maybe, who took this picture of uh, some workers working on the uh, hopper. And there was one guy with his head right up inside the nozzle, which, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, they used to have to do this with a lot of, I mean, obviously you still have to do this, but... There was a, I can't remember what rocket it was, but to start the rocket, it would have a pyrotechnic igniter that would have to be placed inside the combustion chamber. And then it would be wired on outside and then this would provide the ignition source. And supposedly it was a, tr a tradition that whoever was installing these igniters would wear the starter, the ignition key for the rocket around their neck so that nobody could accidentally start the rocket while they had their head inside it. But anyway, yeah, they uh, got to Tuesday night, I think it was five o'clock was their, their time for their firing. And yeah, they t counted down. We saw the engine vectoring to test to make sure that it was gimballing correctly. It ignited and then it lifted off and it rose, I presume, to just under 150 meters and traversed across a fairly large expanse. There was a little bit of rotation, some demonstration of the reaction control thrusters for rotation control. And then it landed and the clock stopped at 57.36 seconds. So that is a reasonably long light, uh, flight. And based on their limitation of less than 30 metric tons of fuel, and the flight time and presuming they had some reserves. I think that it's reasonable to say this rocket was probably around maybe just under 100 tons. We, you know, we don't know the exact mass on it, but that does make it a fairly heavy piece of hardware. For comparison, the Falcon 9 first stage when it is landing after a flight, that is, weighs a lot less than this thing. And this the, the Falcon 9 first stage is a whole lot taller. So this is a big fat, you know, garbage can looking thing. And uh, a big part of this is really just to test the integration of the Raptor engine on a vehicle rather than say a test stand. It was never meant to fly very high. It was largely just to get experience. It was also to get experience with building these vehicles outside, out, out of the controlled conditions that a factory operates using, you know, you know, hardware that's more or less off the shelf. And I think it's admirable. And they're obviously doing that with Starship Prototype 1 and 2 at their two locations as well. So those will be the next ones to fly. They will have three engines. Obviously, the one in Florida is not flying. The one in Boca Chica will be the next one to fly. There's three Raptor engines getting set aside that have already been assigned for it. The... Uh, hopper is being turned into a vertical test stand and presumably it'll sit on some something with a flame diverter and all that. Yeah, the flight looked absolutely beautiful. But, and this is a really big but, you can tell because it has become daytime here. I uh, recorded that whole video in one take and then, you know, went to sleep, woke up and there was a bunch of speculation amongst my email buddies, uh, internet buddies. And uh, I, I originally I changed some of the things that I had originally said. 
So many people ask me why the flame on the exhaust got so yellow as it approached landing. And my original explanation was that as it gets close to the surface, or when it's launching from the surface, the exhaust is impinging, it's kicking up dust, the dust gets into the exhaust and heats up to the same temperature as the exhaust, and then emits black body radiation. This is normal, this is actually seen in other rockets, and uh, the thing is, when you've got a chemically simple set of exhaust products like um, water and carbon dioxide, they can't really emit many, many wavelengths of light. It's very hard for them to do this. So, but I had it having a small particle of dust that heats up and emits black body radiation. And this is why the space shuttle main engine exhaust is practically transparent, but the boosters those are burning solid rocket fuel and they're emitting tiny particles into that exhaust which make them emit such bright flame. So I thought this was a totally perfect, understandable explanation. Also, there was some speculation as to fire being trans, uh, trapped just next to the rocket engine. I thought that was just, you know, fuel-rich um, exhaust products. The Raptor because it's running on methane and liquid oxygen, it does run a little bit fuel rich because that gives it a better specific impulse. It also makes it run cooler. So I thought any excess methane would get trapped under there and would burn like that. But I think there might have been something that didn't quite work as expected because uh, some very persistent people sent me pictures showing that the exhaust, the yellow, bright yellow exhaust starts right at the engine bell. So it's not in training dust, there is something inside the engine that is coming out and it's making it emit. Now, normally you would see that on a Kerolox, Ker your RP-1 rocket, because you've got these complex carbon chains and they form soot particles. I'm not sure how that happens inside uh, a methane oxygen because you would have to polymerize the carbon somehow. Maybe there's some surface inside the engine and it's now dumping out soot. That would be the kind of thing you would expect. Uh, or maybe there's something else coming out the engine. And that might then say, explain why you saw this little uh, flame coming out. Because when you look at it in action, in slow motion, and I'm gonna say, oh God, I should say it by now, Tim Dodd, Everyday Astronaut, he has the best videos of this. He is, go and check his videos because he had the best camera, the best angles, the best slow-mo. Um, so if you want to analyze this footage, use his stuff for sure. And I'm glad that he is quite happy with me sharing it with you. So yeah, just before landing, you do see this little uh, flame initiate and it seems to initiate with a bit of force. There might have been something breaking inside the engine at that point. That's what I'm starting to think. I, there was a lot of speculation that maybe the engine was throttling and the fuel mixture was changing, but that really doesn't make sense because I, I understand it. They're just changing the amount of fuel going through the mixture. They're not really changing the temperature. Oh yeah, and so it comes down and the landing probably wasn't as uh, gentle as they anticipated. So it might have been that they lost thrust uh, just towards the end and it settled a bit faster than normal. And that would explain why, in Tim Dodd's great footage, you see a COPV, a composite overwrapped pressure vessel, probably containing high pressure nitrogen, getting liberated and running for its life across the landscape, propelled by the power, its own rocket engine, if you think about it. This rocket had a rocket flying off of it. It wasn't very well guided, but hey. Yeah, uh, that was a pressure vessel, and obviously SpaceX has not had the greatest luck with COPVs. But then again, when you're building rockets, COPVs are everywhere. It's very easy to implicate them in all sorts of problems. Also, the Starship Hopper, if it were a Disney princess, it would be Cinderella, because once again, it has lost its shoes. It looks like a couple of them have been crushed. They have these little crush structures that have been crushed flat, but on the other side, you can actually see bits of the shoe that cover that just sitting around there because uh, it's lost them. So look, the test looks pretty good, right? The closer you look at it, the less good it looks, but I I'm obviously hoping that this gives them lots of scientific data, lots of information, and they then continue to work on this because the Raptor is clearly uh, a world-class engine and the Starship hopefully will become a world-class rocket. Right now, it's this little, uh, very simple test vehicle, and that's cool, and I'm really looking forward to see Starship actually fly with this, with three engines, so that if they do have a problem, they can land it safely. <laughs> I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.